The Tom Woods Show, episode 716. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, it's almost that time. Bob Murphy and I are hosting a cruise in October 2016. It's the Contra Cruise, named after our podcast Contra Krugman, and we've got a lot of terrific things lined up. How could this not be the best time you've ever had? Check it out at ContraCruise.com. Hi everybody, Tom Woods here. We're talking once again to Pear Beeland who has uh, been a guest on the show in the past, but all the way back on episode 17. So it's been a little while. It's been almost 700 episodes since we've had Pear back on. But he has a brand new book released just yesterday called The Seen, the Unseen, and the Unrealized, How Regulations Affect Our Everyday Lives. That's, of course, going to be linked to at tomwoods.com slash 716. Pear is Assistant Professor of Entrepreneurship and the Records Johnston Professor of Free Enterprise at the School of Entrepreneurship at Oklahoma State University. You can follow him on Twitter at Pear Beeland, and that's P-E-R-B-Y-L-U-N-D, or check out his website at PearBeeland.com. Pear, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me again, Tom. It's good to be back. Let's talk about regulation. A lot of times people think that the problem with libertarians in particular is that they don't believe in regulation. And what kind of a blockhead would you have to be? What kind of a numbskull would you have to be not to recognize the merits of regulation? Now, in your book, you're taking on – you're not looking at a particular kind of regulation or empirical examples of regulation. You're looking at regulation as an economic phenomenon and tracing out its various consequences. So you are really taking this on at the most fundamental level. So let me take you outside your book a little bit and just start off by saying, is it correct to say that libertarians don't believe – and by the way, I know you haven't written – you've written a book on economics, not on libertarianism, but – you know, I have a libertarian audience, and let's talk about that. Is it correct to say libertarians don't believe in any form of regulation? Is that how you would put it? No, it's not. Um, I mean, we we would believe in any kind of regulation that is market-based, that is voluntary, such as standardizations in technology and so forth. Uh, if it's regulation in the sense uh, of when the government does it, that is prohibition or simply outlawing certain actions – uh, making trade impossible because you will put people in jail or things like that, then, uh, of course, we're not pro such regulations in any form. All right. So now – so it's not that we oppose all forms of regulation. It's – it's there's something about government regulation as opposed to some professional association certifying the quality of some product. There's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But why is there nothing wrong with that? What is it particularly about government regulation that we should – that should arouse our skepticism? Well, I contrast it in the book with destruction. Um, and the point with doing that is, is part of playing off of Frederick Bastiat's uh, well-known essay on the seen and the unseen where uh, – just to recap very quickly – where a, a boy uh, destroys a window – and people say, oh, my goodness, that's, that's horrible. You destroyed the window. And then someone says, well, wait a minute. That means that the glazier gets uh, more business, so uh, he can invest that money in doing something else and so forth. So there's actually a, a good economic effect of destroying the window. Uh, that is what is seen. Of course, the unseen is what would have happened otherwise, that, that the, uh, the owner of that building would probably have bought a pair of shoes or something like that. Um, with government... Uh, stepping in uh, and regulating a business, what they're really saying is that certain sets of actions or certain types of actions are never, ever okay to do. Destruction uh, sets sets us back a little bit in terms of, of value. Uh, we lose value, but it also means that we change our preferences. So in the case of, of that Bastiat talks about, for instance, where uh, with the window, uh, the owner of the house changes his preferences I mean, he's, he's made worse off, of course, because he has to buy a window. But it's also the case that suddenly he values getting a new window higher than the other, uh, the other things that he could have done with the money otherwise. With regulation, we don't really change our preferences. 
the preferences are exactly the same, but we cannot take certain actions to satisfy those, those preferences, which means there is a mismatch suddenly between what people want to do, what people would value doing, and what they can do. And it's, it's not like that it's costly, which is a problem that the market uh, sort of deals with and, and overcomes at least, at least uh, more and more uh, the more we produce. But uh, it's something we, we cannot do, and it's, it's uh, prohibited uh, based off of violence. So it's not really a cost. It's a, and there's also not a temporary setback. It's not something we can get around really in the market because it means dealing with violence, which is a non-market measure. All right, let's 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 try and walk through this. Uh, maybe you can give us an example of how a particular regulation following the way you think about it. I mean, I mean, just think of it this way. Most people hear regulation and they think, this is a case of government wanting to make me safer. Whether it's financial regulation, wanting to keep my money safer, or it's regulation of consumer product quality, it's to keep me either from being ripped off or from being physically harmed by a consumer product. Yes, government is taking some options away from me, but these are options no one in his right mind would want to exercise. So what's the problem? Well, I mean, and very, very often it, I would add just for the sake of those in, in government that they probably mean well in many cases as well. I mean, they want to save people from themselves and so forth. Whether we agree with it or not is, is another matter. But um, I'm sorry, what was the question again? Well, the question is, given that you're saying that with regulation, people simply have their options taken away, and that's, that's it. It's a destruction of their options. But most regulations people are familiar with are – taking away options no one would want to exercise. My option to buy an exploding toaster, my option to put my money in an unsound bank, why would I want those options? I'm glad those are regulated away. Well, right, and, and those things would probably be taken care of by the market anyway, because you don't make money selling toasters that explode unless it's for, for an, a movie set or something like that. But the problem here is, is thinking about it as a one-shot game, as an economist would, would call it, uh, talking about regulation as affecting only what is what regulation directly uh, is aimed at affecting <clears throat> and the point of the book that uh, that I've written now is is to, to trace the real effects of regulation by not only looking at as Bastiatas the, the seen and the unseen in the first step but actually going through sort of the Cantillon effects throughout the market process and look at how does this affect other choices that we make how does this affect production that could be very far removed from uh, what is directly uh, affected by the regulation. And, and what are the effects then for, for people who seem to be not affected at all uh, by this? And, and what I find is I have an example in the, uh, at the very end of the book where I go through a little society talking about, okay, so this is, I trace out uh, production and I walk through sort of value creation in this little market without any regulation. And then I, I go through the same example again and I, I look at, okay, so what happens if there is just one minor regulation that is very specific and it has only to do with one specific type of production? What happens to what everybody's doing, uh, the value that is available in this marketplace and so forth? And it turns out that in a very, very small example, uh, everybody's affected in a negative way. Uh, everybody's worse off um, several people have jobs that they would rather not have, and there's less specialization, which means simply that the whole market uh, is set back and constantly set back as well. So it's not, it's not like I mentioned before, a destruction is something that we can uh, work around and that we can regain sort of the value that was, was produced and destroyed. But a regulation uh, sets back the market basically forever. Let's, I, I want to come back to that example, but let's talk about, uh, you actually mentioned sweatshops in your book as a kind of example of what you're talking about. How does, how does sweatshops fit into this? Well, it fits into the whole contrast between the seen, the unseen, and the re unrealized, which is the, the title of the book. And the unrealized is sort of my own addition to this. Um, and in terms of the sweatshop, when, when we talk about the sweatshop, of course, you have the the progressives who are outraged by the sweatshop and they see how people are working in those sweatshops at terrible pay and, and they don't have any 
Western safety standards and they don't have, as would be the case in, for instance, Sweden, my home country, they don't have five weeks of paid vacation and things like that. Instead, <clears throat> they're working really hard, probably six, six days a week and so forth. Uh, so it's terrible. Well, that's the scene. The unseen is what would have happened uh, had they not been given this option, this, this job in the sweatshop. And of course, as libertarians, we use that argument quite a bit, and, and some conservatives do as well, that saying that, well, the sweatshop is better than the op other options that they have, simply because it pays better, it is a better job, and people are actually lining up to get those jobs, because the, very, many, of, many times the alternative for them is prostitution or, or starving to death, and those are definitely not very attractive choices. Now, the unrealized is, what would have been had there not been regulation in this market? And that, that would be the options that would have been there had there not been regulation. And when I talk about this, I show that, that for, for a sweatshop, there's nothing technologically saying that you should, couldn't have this level of productivity and this level of production anywhere in the market. Because the sweatshop is there, so it proves that it is, it is feasible, technologically speaking. It's not feasible economically, unless you are the sweatshop. And the reason for that is that there is some form of regulation that is setting the market back, that is forcing out certain actors, that is keeping uh, production and value creation down to a lower level, which creates these monopoly situations for, for those companies running the sweatshops, which means that what the, the real problem for these people uh, in these poor countries is not that the, the sweatshop offers a job that is not as cushy as a, a university professor in the US, but that there are not more jobs just like that. Why aren't all jobs in these countries as good as the sweatshop? Or, or possibly better. And that's where regulation comes in. This is because of regulation on international trade um, and things like that, that affects who is actually producing in this country, where can these people get jobs and so forth. Let me ask you if this um, is an illustration of what you're driving at in the book. Ben Powell gave a talk on sweatshops at the Mises University program this year. And one of the points he made involved some interviews that he did with people who actually work in sweatshops. Uh, he actually went to, uh, I don't remember which, it might have been Guatemala and possibly one other place, and he actually sat down and said, all right, suppose you could get the following amenities, but it would mean a slight decrease in your take-home pay. You know, you could have uh, more pleasant working conditions, you could have uh, the, you know, the hours that you want, you could have more breaks, you could have whatever it is. And he had a whole long list of things. And overwhelmingly, I mean, uh, very often 90 plus percent of the answers were no. No, we don't want that. At this state of the development of the country, uh, they didn't quite put it this way, we would rather have the money. Right now we just need the money. Yeah, it'd be nice to have the money and comfort, but right now I'll take the money. And then later in my life, I'll see what my combination of desires is. But, of course, we know that what regulation does all over the world is to deprive people of that choice, to be able to choose the combination of, of uh, compensation forms that they might want. They, yeah, they want money, but they also want these other things. Well, maybe, but it turns out, turns out they really just want the money. But if government says, well, sorry, you have to also have this amenity, they're going to lose some of the money they want. They're actually going to be worse off than if they'd been allowed to make their own choice. So is that an illustration of what you're driving at? Well, sort of, but, but that is the sort of direct effect. Uh, and what Ben is talking about is really the, the unseen. What what are the options? I mean, would they would they choose to not have these? Uh, their pay, would they choose to have something else instead of the pay if they had the trade off, which is rec basically recognizing both the seen and the unseen? What I'm talking about is is the whole the market process as a whole, um, and yeah, they, they these people really like their their jobs in the sweatshop because they are a lot better than any other job that they could possibly get. But what would have been the case? had we not regulated and basically stifled uh, the market process in these countries and elsewhere in the, in the world, what sort of options would they have had and what alternatives had they been presented with uh, in addition to the sweatshop? That is the, what is unrealized and obviously you, you can't study that because those options are unrealized. Um, and, and that's not really part of, of Ben's story. 
uh, I think Ben is doing great work on that and show, showing exactly how, how sweatshop actually uh, benefit uh, people in poor countries and how that is a, a way of, of letting these, these people and those countries uh, catch up with the wealth that we have accumulated and created uh, in the West. But I think another important uh, point is to look at the unrealized and look at where could we have been um, without these regulations. I saw an article on lurockwood.com many years ago. It was called something like the year 3500, or that's where we would be without the state. And, I, and that is sort of a, a, a summary of my book, because what I'm, I'm doing is, is looking at the market process. What sort of value, what sort of, of, of a prosperity is produced in the market? And what happens if you add a little regulation, just a little bit somewhere, just for, for someone's safety or someone's security, or making sure that people get a little vacation or that they get sick leave and don't get fired, or something that seems almost harmless and, and very beneficial for, for those who, who get this sort of benefit. But what happens to the market overall? And, and what sort of services do not uh, get produced? What sort of products will not be offered? Uh, how does this affect the whole capital structure in the market? What, what sort of machines, what sort of knowledge is never produced because we have regulation in some area that seems very specific, that seems very uh, limited, but still affects everybody's actions through ripple effects in, in the market and thereby sets the whole market process back. L let me ask you to do something that's quite difficult, actually, but I like putting the burden of the difficult tasks onto the guests squarely. You say that at the end of the book, you do have this example where you walk through a society, more or less laissez-faire society, and then you introduce a regulation, and then you walk through step by step what the ripple effects wind up being. Now, that, that may be hard to reproduce in its entirety, so we'll tell people that it is more involved than you're saying, but I wonder if you could still at least give it a try so that we have a, a clear understanding of what some of these effects that we might not be able to anticipate might actually be in practice so that we can, so we can see the real-life application of this. Well, sure. The, the whole book is really f full of, of these sort of hypothetical examples where I, I, from the beginning, create a little market with just a few people and look at what is trade and how do people benefit from trade and and uh, what happens if there is an, an additional guy added to the equation? Um, and and how, how does this little society uh, evolve over time if we just have trade and, and people only produce for others their specialization? I mean, in, 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 a, in a real market with specialization, we, we do not produce for ourselves. We produce uh, in ways that we produce goods and services that basically serve other people's needs, which means we can specialize in something and become better. Uh, and, and, and that means that we can then uh, benefit ourselves from the result of, of what we produce. So these examples are, are throughout the book and the reader will follow uh, the same population sort of in a, in a small society. And the, the last example is going through sort of the evolution of this market where you have a few people, you have um, a couple of people who are nail smiths, uh, someone who is um, a construction worker, uh, someone who is a, an apple grower and so forth. And I, I walk through this example and, and, and uh, we can see that, well, there, there's suddenly uh, an increase in demand for housing uh, so this construction worker gets a lot of more business, which means that someone else uh, who is interested in construction work, but there is not really market demand, not, at least not sufficient for this lady to, uh, to start building houses. Um, so she, she waits and she, maybe she plans to start this type of business and, and she gains the, the competence and skills and so forth, but she's still working on her second best option, which is something completely different. Uh, but with this increased demand, she suddenly can take the step into building a house for payment. And that in itself means that in this little society, suddenly the, the number of businesses and the number of building projects underway doubles, which means that someone else who's has sort of a 
crappy job uh, can get into a specialization that didn't exist before, but that there is now market demand for. So he goes into producing planks, I believe, um, so that he can sell those to the construction workers, which means that they can focus on building the houses rather than cutting down trees and all this stuff. Um, then I introduce a, a regulation on the nail smiths, uh, saying basically a, a, a real example from the from the real world from industrialization, uh, saying that they need to have taller uh, chimneys because of the soot and all of, all this pollution and everything from from their from their work. And this means that it raises the cost a little bit for the nail smiths. It raises the prices a little bit for for on, on nails in this little market, but it also forces one of those people out of business. He needs to find some other job, uh, which affects how many houses uh, are demanded in the market, which means that this lady who's dreaming about becoming a construction worker and, and producing houses, uh, she will not, she's not able to take that step because there's no market space for it. There's no market demand. And the same thing with this guy who wanted to specialize in producing planks. He can no longer do this because there's only one, only one construction worker and only one house being built. So this construction worker, uh, he, he produces the, the planks himself and, and, and cuts down the trees and, and so forth. So even though the regulation has really nothing at all to do with, say, house building and the art of house building, in, in this little example, and there's more to it, of course, um, Suddenly, this market does not have production of planks. Just because there is a regulation on the height of chimneys in the nails for nailsmiths, which is, it seems to not be very related. In this example, they're, they're a little bit related because you can't have a, a market, I think this is like a dozen people, and they don't, don't do related things. But in, in, a, in a very big market, say the global market today as it is, um, Regulating something that seems to have nothing at all to do with you will still affect what choices you can make and what sort of jobs are available for you, what sort of specializations, what sort of goods and services can you buy. But I mean, and not just looking at uh, sort of the purchasing power of, of your wage, but looking at what options are actually made available to you in the market. And, and that's that's the unrealized, what, what never comes to be really uh, for us in our in our real lives because of some regulation somewhere. All right. Now, that that is a good description of these uh, ripple effects. And I think another interesting point of that is that it means that a lot of people who've had their lives dramatically changed for the worse, particularly when it comes to choosing their occupation, will never be able to trace out the the line of causation leading to their distress they'll never trace it back to the regulation maybe they'll blame it on chinese competition or they'll blame it on the free market or they'll bl who knows what who knows what they'll blame it on but they won't place the blame in the right place now is that by the way part of your thinking about this as well or are you because i mean maybe you're just a you're just acting as a dispassionate economist who wants to teach some lessons but to me that's one of the principal lessons, is people won't blame the right source. Well, I, I can't lie to you, Tom, of course. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's uh, how, how I started thinking about this, uh, about regulation, because when we study regulation, we look at the direct effects and maybe sort of the second order effects. But but how does that really affect us? Well, as libertarians or Austrians, we say, well, the whole market is affected somehow. And I, I was interested in seeing, okay, but, but how really? And thinking about it, I realized, that, wait, wait a minute, it's not really only the case that we get a little poorer. Because anyone can say, well, I mean, if I, if I don't get a raise of 5%, but only 4.5% next year, but people get education or whatever, then we could have a little more regulation, a little more taxation and, and whatnot. Uh, it doesn't matter so much. But it's not really. I mean, M Menger taught us already in his uh, magnum opus from the 1870s that we don't talk about goods in, in the same way as, as, as neoclassicals talk about them, as, as a sort of infinitesimal little pieces. We talk about full goods, a whole egg, or if we want to uh, make a pie, maybe we need six eggs. Well, that's the good we want to buy then. Well, that, that is the same thing when, when we have options presented to us in the marketplace, that it's not the case that, they will, that heavy regulation will take away 12% of 
of sort of the choices I can make. No, they take away a number of the goods and services that I would have been able to choose otherwise. So the effect is probably a lot greater and it's not going to be the same for everybody um, depend because we have different uh, wants and, and needs. So some people are going to be a lot worse off and some people are gonna, not going to be all that worse off, but they're going to be worse off anyway. So I wanted to look at sort of the real effects uh, on each person and each individual in the sort of choice situation because that's, that's I think that is the, the powerful argument. It's the sort of a almost emotional argument as well. Um, and I think that is where the discussion should be. Talking about aggregates is not really the Austrian way. And talking about how, how say, the economy doesn't grow uh, the 0.1 percent that, that otherwise would have been growing, that, that doesn't mean anything at all to anybody. So maybe that seems like a small sacrifice to make for the, the promise of some sort of regulation. But if we, if we look at the re unrealized, the options that would have been presented to us or the options that would have been taken away had we had even more regulation, then it becomes a lot uh, clearer to us and a lot more personal. And the question is how, how much have we lost individually and how much have our families lost because of these regulations? What, what exactly would have been uh, available to us had there not been all this regulation? All right, let, let me th play devil's advocate on your example. Uh, the first devil's advocate argument would be, in the same way that there are losers from regulation, surely there are winners. There, are, if, if there aren't going to be as many houses built, well, then something else will be built. Uh, you know, r labor and resources will go into another channel, and maybe there'll be more opportunities over there, and those people benefit. And since we, since we can't assign, uh, you know, c cardinal... Uh, utility to people we can't say we how can we say that my benefiting from the unintended consequences of the regulation isn't as important as your loss from the unintended consequences of the regulation wouldn't we just have to say well it's a wash well that's that's sort of where you would end up if you would only go with the bastiat route right i mean yeah you lost a window pane but look at all these ripple effects it would basically have uh, this Keynesian multiplier effect, right? So the multiplier effect, if, even if we, if we don't, if we skip this, uh, the problem with interpersonal utility uh, comparisons for for a little bit, and just talk about money values, well, you would have multiple multiplier effect, one way or the other. So, like you say, isn't isn't it really not much of a difference anyway? But looking at the unrealized, you add this. This dimension to it, and I think this the, the last example that, that I quickly summarized a, a minute ago actually shows this quite well, that the effect is not simply that some value is taken away from us, but that we uh, miss out on a bunch of specialization in the market. And we, we know since at least Adam Smith, that spe with specialization comes productivity increases, which means that we can create a lot more value using less uh, resources which means that we lose a lot of this growth that we would have had otherwise. So it's not a, a wash, and it's not simply losing a, a window pane, as in, in Bastiat's example. Uh, it's, it's really losing all the potential that, that we would have gotten had, this, had there not been this regulation. And in terms of the window pane, I mean, that's a temporary setback. That's a minor distraction. It happens all the time. And yeah, we replaced the window pane. We would have want, wanted to do something else, but then we... Of course, th this guy adjusts his preferences, and then he chooses whatever he he wants more uh, when he, he does whatever purchasing or or or, or invests his labor or whatever it is. But with regulation, it's basically saying, well, you can never ever buy shoes, as this guy would would have bought uh, had had the window pane not been broken. So okay, so if no one ever can buy shoes, how does that affect the market? Well, obviously, that that means that we will have a, a lot of problems. We will develop uh, products which would never have been um, wanted at all before. So if we can't buy shoes, maybe we would have, we develop products for protecting our feet in ways that are, do not involve shoes. This is complete waste of resources. And the people who would have uh, specialized in shoemaking or any type of supplies needed to make shoes or sell shoes or transport shoes or whatever it is, 
they would have to stick with their old jobs and they would not specialize further. Which means, of course, that the effect on the market process and its value creation is enormous. It is not the window pane. It is a lot, lot more. All right. And one other thing. Let's take your your uh, air pollution example, the example of the chimneys. Now, that's a case. Maybe not all examples are like this, but the one you chose is a case where even in a pure free market, something would have to be done about that pollution because it would be actionable. So there, maybe they would have to make taller chimneys. I mean, maybe in the free market, they wouldn't say to you, here's how you have to solve the pollution problem, but they would say you have to solve it. And that solving it does involve the use of resources, and that will have ripple effects just like a government regulation. So what's the difference? Well, the difference is that you, you get to do what is actually valued in ways that are actually valued. This is part of the... Uh, uh, the, the competition as discovery process, as Hayek talks about, that rather than have a regulator saying you cannot, there, there will be a market demand saying for those who can produce nails, in, in this case, uh, in, a, in a better way or in a less polluting way. Um, so producers will shift their production towards the best use. Well, that is, that is the market process. That is how we produce value. And of course, value is not only products and services offered to us. It is anything we, we subjectively value. It could be clean air, it could be whatever. So, but, but it's easier to talk about it as, as, as physical goods. The regulation, of course, it just says that you cannot ever, and that's it. Um, I mean, say there is, <clears throat> there is some sort of destruction in this marketplace after uh, producers have begun to shift away from sort of this simpler production of nails uh, so that they're cleaning up their processes and so forth. Then there's a destruction. Well, maybe they would go back to producing nails in the old way just because the demand for nails is so much more important um, now that all these resources are destroyed. So it doesn't matter. Pollution is no longer as important as it was. Well, with regulation, you can't do that. You have to go through the political process and change the laws and then change uh, the bureaucracies and so forth. So it's, it's more of a, um, a regulation is forever in a sense that uh, a market standard or uh, mar market technologies are, are not. Because in the market, if something happens, you can always go back. But with regulation, you cannot. All right, good. I, I like playing devil's advocate and I like your answers and I hadn't fully anticipated either one, so I, I like that even more. So I'm going to direct people to tomwoods.com slash 716, which is where I have the Amazon link to your book. Or they can go directly to Amazon and pick up The Seen, The Unseen, and The Unrealized, How Regulation Affects Our Everyday Lives. Best of luck with it, Pear, and thanks for your time today. Thank you so much, Tom. All right. Uh, before I tell you what's going on tomorrow, which is we've got a juicy one coming up tomorrow, this is a blog that is exactly how I would do a blog if I were starting it off uh, at, at the very beginning myself. And this is another Tom Wood Show listener who has started a blog. And you get nice mention on the show plus a nice backlink on my site. If you uh, start your site through my special link, all the details at tomwoods.com slash publicity, including all my free video tutorials to help you get started. Well, the blog is called 2076 Project. Dot com. So 2076project.com. It's a libertarian site, of course, but in particular what I like about it is that it talks about current events. Yes, it talks about – has a post on parents, children, and the non-aggression principle, which is something I talked about uh, on a previous episode with Julie Borowski saying we should write more about that, so we got that there. But it also looks at important libertarian books and gives them quick reviews. It looks at websites or it looks at uh, particular uh, podcasts, gives them reviews. It looks at memes and, and looks at the truth or falsity of these things. So it's got all kinds of things. It's a, it's a potpourri. That's exactly how I would do it. So it's posts about interesting libertarian issues, whether it's Bernie Sanders, Donald Trump, the minimum wage, diversity, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren, but then also looking at important libertarian books like Defending the Undefendable by Walter Block and other important libertarian titles. All these sorts of things are in the posts over at 2076project.com. So I will link to that in case you forget about it. 
at tomwoods.com slash 716 as the listener website mentioned. Remember that tomorrow, if you're listening to this as I release these, tomorrow, which is August 17th, 2016, there is a one-day flash sale over at Bluehost where they're giving away um, web hosting for just $2.95 a month, which is crazy. So you definitely want to lock in that pricing if you can and get all the details about how to do that, how to get all these goodies uh, and uh, at uh, tomwoods.com slash publicity. That's the first link you should look at, tomwoods.com slash publicity, before you do anything else. All right, tomorrow we're talking about the Scandinavian welfare state, the so-called, and actually a little bit broader. Um, we're looking at Nordic socialism, so-called, and the myth of the success of so-called Nordic socialism with the author of a brand new book called Debunking Utopia. So that, that has just come out this week, so it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about that. So you won't want to miss episode 717. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time.